We have what I think is the smallest open mic reading we've had here in nine years, but we'll make it an intense and an attentive reading. We have four people signed up, and I'll also read some poems. And uh, I, I'll, I'll start us out with one poem of mine and read some later. Um, I, I came across this. This is actually written 12 years ago uh, when uh, the Gulf War, the second Gulf War, was happening. And um, this was written for the Poets Against the War website that I was a volunteer editor for. And it's called Iraqi Boys. The Iraqi boy, bouncing a ball in his schoolyard, knows nothing of the wind of falling bombs. Too young to know the crude cost of oil, he does not re recall the liberation that cost him his uncle's lives and limbs. I hope that he might die only of old age and live to buy his grandchildren their own red rubber balls. Tonight's question is, what's your carry go-to karaoke song, which I suppose I should try and answer myself and say, you don't want to hear me sing. Um, however, our victims, I mean our uh, readers tonight, um, do have answers to this question, and our first reader is Herb McCleese. And his go-to karaoke song is the Star Spangled Banner. Come on up, Herb. And you have a new book to show us, don't you? Well, I'm convinced, I'm convinced the Lord loves a bad poet. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. I mean, that driving is horrible on that, the, you know, the highway the lines just disappear. And I came from a, all around 405 and, oh, oy vey. Um, in no particular order, I'd like to read an ekphrastic poem of my own. This is response, uh, I like when I look at art, I look for the problem the artist is wrestling with. So if an artist doesn't have a problem, then I'm not particularly interested. So they tend to grab, something's gnawing at them. They go back and back to the, say again to the same subject. So the uh, uh, art teacher in one of the local high schools, she did uh, fashion drawings. I thought, well, I, won't, I wouldn't be interested in doing that when someone suggested I do a poem about her. And... Uh, I looked at the drawings, and then I looked at more closely. She'd taken the fashion drawing and had a sewing machine go over the lines. I said, that's interesting. So then reading, the, you know, seeing the drawings in person, and then the uh, reading her artist statement, uh, I wrote a particular poem, which hopefully I will find readily. There it is, called Beauty's Work. Can I get this height a little bit more? Okay. Beauty's work. Beauty glimpsed in fabric, drape, and form, in cutting, stitching, sewing, expressed, for a moment can be touched when worn in the admiration of her dress. Some would hold beauty cheap and sell her dear as the latest fashion haute couture for a diva to beauty a stranger though near a prop for her drama a lure but for many beauty is sweated in fittings and alterations is present in a sewing machine's ticking while children nearby play is felt in a mother's devotion and a daughter's adoration and lived in her labor, oblivious to the tick-tock of fashionista stilettos. 
That was inspired by a painting by Laura King. I'd like to read a, uh, a short one that will scare people because they say, my gosh, that's different from what he's been writing before. But one of the reasons to get a book out is to kind of be able to put the door, close the door to some of your other work and start on something new. Precious Cargo. With today's yes and tomorrow's promise, we sail the gulf of doubt through heaving seas of yes and no the fair wind tilts towards dawn. Our cargo is most precious and worthy of special care. And for it I chose a less stormy course, one ruled by mild but fickle wind. But this is proved hard on the crew. For now sails must be in constant trim and rations watched. And when oft be calm, long boats use to turn the ship to catch a fleeting zephyr. Then, this morning at the fix, as Aurora shed her veils, I heard past the waves rush and the hulls creak, a yeoman mutter, no cargo is worth the ship. But mercifully, before I could order the cat for the man who voiced my doubt, I saw your face in the dawn, bright with yes, and praying for fair winds and following seas, stayed the course. And then, if I may finish with a, um, a spiritual journey kind of poem. Flag Dancer. For the boy, a broom handle was enough to spin the world with nimble fingers, a game of momentum and gravity, letting go and catching, falling around a center, scribed in air. Why not add colored flags, I asked. I would like that, he said. Why? Because of the sound. A huge flamingo flock wheels in flight over Lake Victoria. And long ago, a boy bell ding-dongs as I bring my dinghy about her sail luffing. I would like that. Blue. When I saw him, he had added a scarf, pale blue silk, lent by his mom, and was intently twirling his home broomstick flag, blue for the sky, for space, for other worlds, for the caveman's bone toss in 2001, for freedom. White. On another day, he was spinning his pole, outflitted with a snow white flag. Air caressed the flag and drew it out and furled its silk with a thousand fingers. With each orbit, he grew more to feel her resistance and acceptance in an, an ethereal embrace. White for the wind that waves all flags, in war and peace and in Olympic games, flags ringing their halyards at the UN Plaza, nearly 200, and flying prayers in Tibet, a million. Red. His skill improved with each passing day. Now he could twirl his broomstick baton over his head and even toss and catch it. Today he wields a red flag in a Corita display that would arouse Pamplona's proudest bull, Ole. Scarlet for the robes of the bishop who slapped me at confirmation according to tradition and when I was the boy's age. Not hard but deliberately, a buffeting for mindfulness, 
or to drive out the devil, some would say. This is his blood shed for you. Yet his church burns with Pentecostal flames and is not consumed. Hallelujah. Green. This time his baton had a green silk scarf, the color of Indonesian waters years ago when my Dutch ship en route to Singapore waited in Balawan's roads for a launch to transfer refugees. Two families climbed lowered stairs. The children had sun blonde hair. And far out in the Malacca Strait, passing whales sang familial and individual songs heard by kin many miles away in their global migration. Yellow. Today I saw his recital performance. The flag dancer's baton had a bright yellow square conjuring school buses and caution lights. Do I stop or do I go? And wheat fields, ripe pears, and the lure of gold, whose heaviness pulls me down, pulls me sinking, falling down, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, falling forward to rebirth as the prayer wheel turns to turn, turn will be our delight. Now the valley bells tinkling clangor and the winds buffeting and the myriad prayer flags, blue, white, red, yellow, green, and yellow, together transforms an old spirit on his road to Everest. I am now a boy. Thank you. Thank you, Herb. Um, next time, make sure you add the word brine somewhere. <laughs> the word brine. <laughs> Maybe that's... Uh, oh, okay. The brine of the ancient mariner. I think we can tell a little bit about the generation um, uh, our readers are from by their go-to karaoke songs. Johan is our next reader. And his uh, song is Wind Cries Mary. Johan, come on up. He's coming. Yeah. Um, thanks. I, uh... I asked a friend to uh, sometimes to uh, overcome that that dreaded of all obstacles, uh, writer's block. I'll ask for a, a word, and uh, got some really interesting poems from some of these words. But this one, um, I just finished today, and and Michael's uh you know advice I. I rewrote it at least once, so three of the words are different. I hope you don't mind the spelling. Turbulence, like thoughts, can make for a rough ride. Hemispheric balance, hemispheric balance solving for why. Cold fronts or bold ideas pushing against the engine of thought. Warm fronts or wimpy ideas can cause lack of focus. Under certain lights, bold is cold, warm, and wimpy all rolled into one pint of Ben and Jerry's. It's not all a blacklight trap. Some synapses shriek back, referring, of course, to that trick of logic and light we know as smoke and mirrors. Quite the raving, quoth the maven, Usually these, these thoughts are kept for much, much later. Oh, there's a time limit on thought? Can these directions be brought under control? Is there a cat piloting my soul? Because if dog is my co-pilot, I'd prefer they find common ground instead of chasing each other's tail 
round and round. Since these empty pockets of air and thought only keep my hands warm, at least these wings will be level as we fly into the storm. Every bolt of lightning, every thunderclap, the white stripe on the skunk saying, don't touch that. Each gauge, every turn of a prop, flying itself proof that nature knows math. Thank you. One of these days I'll, I'll go over these and see if they actually sound cohesive, you know, when I've shut off my, my creative side of the brain. Um, we've got one more. I'm not sure. I might have read this one once before, but it's at the very beginning of the book, so I'm not sure. Looking for the uh, legible version. Purple and mud combine in my blood. Royal pollution turning thoughts cold. Freezing, cracking, breaking all chances. Life a myriad of devils dancing. Foxtrot, two-step, Tennessee waltz, Tomorrow's steps emerge from last night's fog. Dreams and visions colliding like atoms. Clarity vanished. Focus is scattered. Yet, of all the gifts I've wasted, your love is most disgraceful. If I must, if I must, if I must let you go, I'll have the strength only because you've made my heart whole. Thursdays and Saturdays, so far away, desperado, sung by the man in black, before it's too late, before it's too late. No surprise fear becomes control. Is that witnessing inherited hate? Emotions warped, not by fate. My heart growing stronger within your embrace. Thank you. Thank you. This is another older poem of mine. Uh, digging these out because I was sorting through a bunch of poems and I thought, well, I haven't read this one myself for a long time. Uh, this was written actually just before, a few months before September 11. And... Uh, it seemed to gain something after the event. It's called The Gloved Hand. They don't know whose it is, but there's a hand on the table. It is not small or big. It is a left hand, palm up with a long lifeline and has an untanned circle around the ring finger. Little flaps of red flesh make the ends of the ulna and radius seem whiter than they really are. It is dry but still pink and blood no longer leaks from the wrist. One of the corners makes the middle finger twitch by pulling a white tendon at the wrist till it snaps from his gloved fingertips. They don't know whose hand it is, but now they have four fingerprints and half of the firefighter's thumbprint. Our previous readers' karaoke song was Wind Cries Mary, and now we go to another song, Proud Mary. And here to sing it for us is Michael Hevener. You wouldn't, you wouldn't dare make me sing that. <laughs> I only do that in the shower in the car. Uh, when I came down here, I was thinking about a conversation that my son and I have been having about what happens in the future, whether 
things with cords and microprocessors will eventually link together and form some sort of master brain that takes over and ruins the earth. And I have been thinking in less apocalyptic terms and as you were reading Anne, I'd se it suddenly all gelled for me. So uh, I'm going to take this one home and read it to him after you hear it. Who will survive me? Google, do you know who my children will be? Will they be flesh and breath, worms and earth, bacteria begetting toads, begetting apes, begetting me to be myself? But are my children really my progeny or merely a form of history? And after them, what comes next? What indelible life will leave its tracks in the mud and dust of time? They say that man is the highest form of life that will ever exist. And I say, how can that be? We must have some higher reason to live and love and pray and die. Are my children doomed to be father, mother, womb, and seed to a race of thinking apes? Perhaps those things they have, the toys of technology that link through brick and walls as if just air, perhaps a million phones when chained in synapses of silicon, or circuits that talk and write and build autos of shiny steel. Why can't they be the legacy we leave to raise the earth out of our stink and slime? They know more than we, encyclopedic toys that spout the wisdom of the years, tiny things with eyes far better than the bravest wolf. Perhaps my children won't be toddlers I can teach in simple words to speak as men. Perhaps this will be my legacy. Cortana, sing me a song. Thank you. Thank you. Here's another poem of mine. This is called Confessions of a Learned and Publishing Professor. I think that I should like to be considered a difficult poet. I should like my metaphors to be uncanny. I should like my images to be not merely deep, but unusurpable. I should like my implications to be palpably plangent, my themes insubordinate, my forms diabolical. I should like my rhythms to be poison or feathers, or perhaps with increasing regularity, ineluctable. I should want my first editions to be squabbled over on eBay the cues to be tedious at my book signings. I should like, in fact, to have a society about me before I am dead. I should like the Pulitzer, the Lily, the Nobel, and how about a knighthood, and while I'm at it, sainthood. Then, surely, I will enter the canon and gain, finally, tenure. And to close us off tonight, Aaron, are you ready? Now, um, here's a generational thing here. Uh, his karaoke song is Cakes Going the Distance, which I'll have to look up on YouTube or something. Aaron. took it upon myself uh, every time. I've been here for about three years and um, been to almost every single poetry open mic night in the three years that I've been here. So I finally took it upon myself. Every time this happens, as soon as Michael shows up, I start trying to write a poem. Um, doesn't matter whether it rhymes or what comes out. Just try to get words out and then see what happens. And I sat and I scribbled and I've got proof that I was writing and writing and crossing things out and writing, and <clears throat> he kept saying haiku, and so the only thing I got was one haiku. <laughs> I wanted to write a story about an old black crow and the fat house cat and make it a beautiful metaphor for God and man and the search for truth and all that kind of stuff, and this is what I got. An old black crow perched. The old growth tree stands proudly. A fat 
house cat waits. <laughs> and then I was wondering if everyone's okay with it. I know it's a poetry open mic, but uh, it's been like over a week since I performed a song in front of people. I'm a singer songwriter, and so I was wondering if everyone would be okay with a song. Can't say I wanted love Won't say I needed love But I'm gonna get that love And I will not do it wrong Living's mostly wasting share of mine it don't never feel too good so let's not take too long she's a song broken wings and the sleep out of my eyes. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you very much, Aaron. Here's to all the poetry.
thank you to Anne McDuffie and Michael Schmelzer and for those who uh, have participated in our open mic and the rest of you who have listened. Thank you for coming tonight. And if you can come back next month, um, Roberto Ascalon and Ellie, suddenly going blank on her name, are featured readers next, next month. So please come back. Um, again, thank you to our featured readers and good night.